Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship as we gather together in community in this place. I don't know about you, but adding an extra hour to my morning didn't, didn't pay off. It still feels like we're an hour behind and we're having some Facebook live stream issues, so just one of those mornings, but it's good to be together, good to center ourselves in this place and in the presence of one another. It is the first Sunday of the month, and so a thank you to Nancy and Bev for receiving our fun script orders. And as always, if you didn't have a chance to um, give in your orders prior to worship, you have a chance after worship because it's also coffee hour today hosted by our pastoral care and outreach um, committee. So please join together downstairs for a time of friendship and refreshments as we gather together. As we gather in community, as in a community of faith, we hold and enfold in our care and prayer this morning the family of Colleen Simpson, especially her hu husband Earl. Many of you may know Colleen and Earl, and in recent years they were both residents of our Maritime Odd Fellows Nursing Home. Um, Colleen passed away this past week, and a memorial service for Colleen will be held this coming Wednesday, 11 a.m. at the McLaren Funeral Home, and the details can be found on the McLaren website. But I do invite you to hold Colleen, Colleen's family, and especially Earl, in your prayers and in your care today. As you turn to your bulletin, you'll see all the various announcements that are happening, all the events and activities that are continuing in our life of our church community. A reminder that this afternoon, our long-awaited musical production, A Sentimental Journey, Song of the War Years, just a tribute to Remembrance Day and to our veterans and our current members of our armed forces. Um, the show begins at 2 p.m. Um, doors will open at 1.30 and there are tickets at the door or if you want to see Sandy or Ruth following worship, you can get your tickets in advance. But please, this afternoon at 2 p.m., a good opportunity for us to be uplifted by songs and stories and gather together for a favorite musical production. I do invite you to go through the bulletin and note the announcements there and especially for members of our council that were called to meet this coming Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Are there other announcements that need to be made as we gather in community? Events, activities, what's up in the life of our church? What's up, Sally? And Sally, do you have a birthday coming up this week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Sally has a birthday. That's what's up, Sally. Friday. 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 <laughs> Sally's having a birthday Friday. She, she doesn't even remember where and when it is. But any other birthdays? Any other celebrations that are happening? Karen. David's is Tuesday. So... A happy birthday to David, and David's planning on being here this afternoon if he's able, so we can wish him a happy birthday. So a happy birthday to David, happy birthday to Sally. Any other happy birthdays? You snooze, you lose. <laughs> happy birthday. Let's <laughs> It is good to gather in community, to enfold one another in times of sorrow and sadness and grief and to uplift one another in times of celebration and joy and goodness. It is good. This morning as we gather in worship, as indicated by the cover of your bulletin, which might be looking a bit familiar by now, a little bit of changing up each week, but the, this 
service brings to a close a three-part worship service. Our Sunday theme, finding their home and finding their weaving and the pondering of what is called the call of our United Church, a call for this time to deep spirituality and bold discipleship and daring justice. A call that's not only intended to inspire the work of our national church, but to inspire our work and ministry as members of this community of faith. But what does this call to bold discipleship or deep spirituality or today daring justice mean for us? What does it mean as we seek to live into what Dr. Martin Luther King called the beloved community? What are the costs of living these calls, of living deep spirituality, of living bold discipleship, of living daring justice? Costs of living, not only in economic terms, but in terms of our spiritual lives, those other costs of simply living. So today we'll be reflecting on that call to daring justice and the cost of living out that call that sometimes gets ourselves into trouble or as we'll discover this morning, good trouble. And so again, a thank you for entering into this series of worship services and a thank you to my DeBert planning colleagues for the creative process that led to these worship gatherings. So let us gather in community. Let us come to this place. For here we have gathered, and in our gathering we bring the elements of our lives. Aware and unaware, we have carried them to this place. The joy of waking and living the pleasure found in meaningful work, the struggles of our days, the blush of health, the pain of illness, the grief of loss, and the gifts of love. Some of these we have carried a long way. Some have bent our backs until our eyes could no longer see the horizon. Some have carried us upward with meaning, purpose, and vision. All we have carried through the seasons of our lives has brought us here to this place. All of it made sacred by our coming together and by our affirming of each other and our greeting to each other. Come, you are welcome here. Go deep, they say, but deep can be frightening. I am far from the safety of the shore. What if I run out of breath? But deep can also be enlivening. It is when we leave the shallows that we truly connect with one another and with God and are reminded that the breath of life will always sustain us. Be bold, they say, but being bold gets me noticed and sometimes labeled in ways I don't want to be, bossy, pushy, strange. But bold also means that we are courageous and confident 
in who and whose we are. We belong to God, and we are called to share God's love and do God's work in the world. Be daring, they say, but being daring inevitably puts me outside my comfort zone, and that can be dangerous. But God never said a life of faith would be safe or easy. Sometimes we must set aside our comfort for the good of all and for the sake of justice and righteousness. So come, let us worship the one who calls us to deep spirituality, bold discipleship, daring justice.
Nicaraguan poet Javier Torres reminds us, if the hunger of others is not my own, if the anguish of my neighbor in all its forms touches me not, if the nakedness of my brother and sister does not torment me, then I have no reason to go to church and live. Life is this, to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is the commandment of God. Love means deeds, not good wishes. Love means deeds, not good wishes. Let us be gathered and grounded in prayer. Sacred presence, from a world of injustice and pain, brokenness and frailty, hurt and anger, we come seeking grace and longing to be enfolded by love. We want to be challenged by Jesus' teachings and the faithful witness of our ancestors in faith. We long to be shaped and formed into compassionate community that embraces diversity, celebrates difference, and works to create a place of welcome for all. Imprint us with your justice loving ways and sustain us with your powerful vision for our lives. As we pause in prayer, May we become ever aware of your presence within us and around us. Might there be some friends who want to join me? I see some new friends with me this morning. Anyone want to come and join me? Jeannie's always a good friend. <laughs> Hi there. Good to have you with us. I'm glad I brought something with you. Want to sit here with me? Can you see under this dome what I have? Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. It's very, very, very special. Do you know what it is? I don't know. It's hard for, because I don't want to spill it. That's when you need a close-up angle. Yeah. Jeannie, do you know? Whoa! <laughs> Jeannie, do you know what this is? Keep on. This is very, very precious. In ancient days, this, well, this one would be referred to as white gold. It was so precious, so rare that people used it like we use money. You know how we go to a store and use money? People would bring this to wherever they wanted to buy something and they would use this because it was so rare and precious. Have you ever heard the word salary? Do you know what a salary is? It's something when someone has a job, they get paid a salary. Well, it actually, that word salary comes from the Greek word for this. It's salt. It is salt. I have some different forms of salt here. Do you know, I was doing some research about salt. Do you like salt? When do you use salt? 
on French fries. Oh my. If you ever notice that, I mean, that's why salt, I think, is so rare. That if you take a French fry without salt, do they taste good? What makes McDonald's fries taste so good? The salt and the ketchup. And what's in ketchup but salt and sugar? Two main things. But salt is very, very rare and precious. Do you know that there's over 20 different forms of salt that I could find, just putting a Google, and they're just for cooking. That's not to talk about salt we put on our road, or sometimes people use these. These are called Epsom salts. Anyone you have Epsom salts at home? What do you use them for, Jane? You put them, and why do you put them in your bath? They help your bones, and they also help your skin. They soften your skin. Anyone else have a salt scrub in their shower or in their bathroom? There's salt scrubs, and you use those to soften your skin. Why do we put salt in our cooking? Why do we put salt in? Brings out the flavor. Salt brings out the flavor. It's said that some recipes are total failures if you forget the salt because the salt reacts with the other ingredients in bread. Genie's our bread maker. What happens when you forget your salt in your bread? It tastes terrible. Does it rise or anything? Well, that's the yeast. It still rises, it just not yeast. There's a story in the Bible that I'm going to be sharing, and Jesus was talking to his followers, and Jesus said, you know, as a follower of Jesus, as someone who shares God's love, you should be like a candle. You should be like a light shining. And that kind of makes sense. And then Jesus said, but you should also be like salt. That's kind of funny to be like salt, isn't it? A funny thing to tell someone. But we've talked about all the reasons, all the importance of salt. Salt brings out flavor. Salt makes things better. Salt cares for us, like those Epsom salts in the bath. So when we hear Jesus talking about you should be like salt, it's not so strange after all, because also salt, as I said as we began, is very, very precious, very, very valuable, just like each of us. We're very, very precious, and we're very, very valuable. And so, maybe next time we taste our french fries and taste the salt, we'll think about our salt in a different way. Now, of course, the medical people here will want me to say, too much salt isn't good for you. But maybe a lot of salt in our world would be pretty good, because if we all share God's love and flavor our world with love, I think that that would be a good thing. We have been learning a song. Now, I know it's going to be new for you, but it's also new for, for some of us. It's about a song about a wise person and a foolish person. And Jesus also told the story how if you're wise, you build your life on a firm foundation and it holds. But if you're not so wise and a bit foolish, you might build your house on some sand or some salt. And that really, not a good way to build your house because it's just going to go away. So we're going to sing that, this song one more time as we continue to learn a new song for us called The Wise One and the Foolish One. And there's...
to have you with us. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you after worship. We continue to open our hearts, our lives to the wisdom of God as it's found in scripture, as it dwells deep within us, and as it is found all around us. And today, once again, we turn to the teachings and stories and the wisdom of Jesus as it's shared in the gospel we name Matthew. The first reading is part of the same extended section of teachings that we heard from last Sunday and the Sunday before. Last Sunday were the blessed are or the, the godlike are. And as Jesus brings his litany to a close, Jesus continues to teach the followers, sharing with them wisdom about who they are and who they are called to be and why they are to be at work in the world. They are to be gods. Jesus here perhaps is calling them, like us, to live into deep spirituality, to be bold disciples, to engage in daring justice. And so we open our hearts to wisdom. Reading from Matthew. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a mountainside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. Let me tell you why we are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to look, put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors of the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on the hill. If we make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep, a, a, keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, You'll prompt people to open up with God, our generous Abba God in heaven. 
In a word, what we're saying is, grow up. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others, the way God lives toward you. Reading again from Matthew. Jesus ended his long teaching sermon with this story. Just remember. Anyone who hears these words of mine and lives by them is like a wise builder. The wise builder builds the house on a strong foundation of rock. The rain falls, floods come, Wind blows and beats against the house, but the house will not fall since it was built on solid rock. Anyone who hears my words but does not live by them is like a foolish builder. The foolish builder builds a house on sand. The rain falls, floods come, winds blow and beats against the house, and the house falls with a great crash flat, since it was built on shifting sand. The crowds were amazed at Jesus' teaching, and they knew they could trust his words.
I find it interesting about how sometimes, or many, many times, I guess, what is happening for me in terms of my worship life and my worship planning and focus begins to connect in ways I didn't expect. And I mean, little did we know when my colleagues and I gathered in June and pondered this cost of living theme and making that connection between Matthew's words and the theme from Cheers, little did we know of how that song would not only become an earworm for us, but how the words of that song could resonate in these days and for our lives. This week, our Affirming Ministries team hosted an evening of education and conversation, Gender 101, with our guest, Travis Freeman from Pictou County Pride. Travis shared much with us. He spoke out of, out of a very personal and authentic perspective and out of his lived experience as a trans male. And in his sharing, Travis brought our attention to the importance of language and the importance of naming and being named. The importance of correct terminology and pronouns as it relates to gender, sexuality, and our identities. And as I sat there, the earworm began to play. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. At the very heart of the work of Affirming Ministries and our Affirming Ministries team, at the very heart of what we're seeking to be about, is reflecting on what it means for us to live into God's expansive love. To create a place where everybody knows your name, where everybody's glad you came. The very heart of why we are educating ourselves, at the very heart of Travis's words to us, is that desire to create safe places, loving places, affirming places and spaces and communities, again, where everybody knows your name, where everybody's glad you came. And not only knows your name, but honors that name by calling you by that name. And indeed, using the pronouns that you choose to use for yourself. Him, he, she, her, they, them. It seems pretty basic, doesn't it? To simply honor and affirm one another as we use the names, including the pronouns that we choose to be called by. Norm! That simple act of calling someone by their name that act of uplifting the belovedness of another person, of affirming and reminding them that they are welcomed and they are accepted and they are loved and we're glad that they came. All of us, full stop. Now, of course, there was much more to what Travis offered to us and shared with us. And I think I can speak for those who are part of the evening that there was a deep importance in that joining together in education and conversation. Now, I know that this one evening will not bring an end to homophobia or transphobia or bigotry or fear or ignorance. However, it's one step in the work. And if I might be so bold to say, it is part of our call to be salt, to be light, to embody God's daring justice. 
Now, if I'm going to be honest again, I need to be say that at, at first I was disappointed by the turnout, not hoping, you know, I wasn't sure how many we'd have, but I guess I was hoping for a, a bigger turnout. So maybe beginning to judge that it wasn't as successful as I was thinking. But again and again, I need to remind ourselves, I need to remind myself that living into our call, living into that call of being God's beloved community, affirming our blessedness and the blessedness of all people, offering those opportunities for conversation and education and understanding, all of that work, all of ministry isn't about being successful. Not in terms of numbers. It is about being faithful. It's about being faithful. I want to share a comment that was made on our Picto United Church Facebook page in regard to Wednesday's event and Gender 101. Someone wrote this. I just wanted to say that it warmed my heart to see this post coming from a church. I know we're in 2024, but there are still so many religious spaces that are not open for those of us who are part of the queer community. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for your support. How many were expecting me to read a hate comment? I'm sure there's also those out there. And I'm sure there are those who just wish we would stop flying the rainbow. And I'm sure there are those who look at this church and think, well, they're not real Christians. There is so much hate out there. And you don't have to be in Madison Square Garden to know that. That call to be salt, to be light, to live daring justice is no small thing. How we respond to that call, the cost of living out that call, is also no small thing. It will get us into trouble. It has and it will. But perhaps we should use the term of justice advocate and outspoken Congressman John Lewis, as he would say, it will get us into good trouble. Good trouble. John Lewis, 17-term U.S. Congressman, civil rights leader, social justice advocate, outspoken, charismatic, coming deeply out of the history of the black church and the civil rights movement in the US. If you don't know the name John Lewis, look him up. John Lewis died in July of 2020 at the age of 80. He was a son of a sharecropper, grew up in rural Alabama, Lewis would often recall that as a little boy, he lived in constant fear because all around him, all he saw were signs that said, no colored boys allowed. His parents would also remind him when he went to school, went out in the day, now don't get into trouble. But as a young man, Lewis was inspired by people like Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King and others. And as Lewis would write, they inspired me, they inspired us to find a way. They inspired me to get in the way. They inspired me to get into trouble, necessary trouble, good trouble. 
good trouble. In fact, that's the title of the documentary of his life, a documentary that chronicles his life of social activism, his actions on civil rights and voting rights and gun control and racial, racial justice and LBGTQ rights and health care reform and immigration. And yes, you can safely assume that Lewis and Donald Trump did not share a warm relationship. You can read all about that too. Speak up, said Lewis. Speak out. Get in the way. A few months before his death, at a rally he wrote, he spoke, now get into good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. For Lewis, good trouble was essential for social change and daring justice. And Lewis knew the cost of living it. He paid the cost of good trouble. Racist mob attacks, police beatings, arrest, imprisonment. All the costs of living out his deep belief and his hope that people of good trouble could give birth to a new world, a new society, that beloved kingdom, that beloved community where all were welcomed, where all were uplifted, where all were given basic human dignity and rights, all. Full stop. He knew the cost, but his vision, his commitment, his faith to the God's beloved community, that was his life's work. A final story. It comes from his memoir, Walking in the Wind, a memoir of a movement. Lewis shares this story. It was Saturday. On this particular afternoon, there was about 15 of us, children outside my Aunt Seneva's house, playing in her dirt yard. The sky began clouding over. The wind started picking up. Lightning flashed far off in the distance. And suddenly, we weren't thinking about playing anymore. We were terrified. Aunt Seneva was the only adult around, and as the sky blackened and the wind grew stronger, she herded us all inside. Now, her house wasn't the biggest place around, and it seemed even smaller with so many children squeezed inside. It was small, but surprisingly quiet. All of the shouting and laughter that had been going on earlier outside had stopped. The wind was howling now, and the house was starting to shake, and we were scared, and even Aunt Seneva was scared. And then it got worse. The house began to sway. The wood plank flooring beneath us began to bend, and then a corner of the room started to lift up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. None of us could. The storm was actually pulling the house towards the sky, and we were in it. That's when Aunt Seneva told us to hold hands, to line up and hold hands. We did just as we were told. And then she had us walk as a group, toward the corner of the room that was rising. From the kitchen to the front of the house we walked. The wind was screaming outside and the sheets of rain were beating off the tin roof. And then, as the other end of the house began to lift, we began to walk towards that corner of the house. And so it went back and forth, back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding 
hands, holding hands so that trembling house would stay down with the weight of our tiny bodies. Walking, holding, keeping it steady. Lewis continues, more than half a century has passed since that day, and it struck me more than once over these many years that our society is not unlike the children in that house, rocked again and again by the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us seeming at times as if they'll fall apart. It seemed that way in the 1960s at the height of the civil rights movement when America itself felt as if it might burst at the seams. So much tension, so many storms. But for people of consciousness, we never left the house. We never ran away. We stayed. And we came together and we did the best we could, clasping hands, moving towards the corners of the house that were the weakest. And then another corner would lift and we'd go there. And eventually, inevitably, the storm would settle, the house would stand, still stand. But we knew another storm would come and we'd have to do it all over again. And we did, and we did, and we did. And we still do, all of us, you and I. That's good trouble. That's daring justice. That's what it means to be salt and light. All of us holding hands, moving to where we need to be in the midst of the storms of our lives and the storms of our world. All of us, full stop, good trouble. God's beloved children creating God's beloved community. All of us holding hands against the wind. May it be so. holding hands, walking against the wind. I love that imagery. And I thank you for the many ways in which you hold hands, many ways in which you hold one another's hands, the many ways in which you hold hands together and walk into the wind, seeking to be God's beloved community in our time and in our our place. I give thanks for the gifts that you offer, but most importantly, for the gift that you are. Thank you.
in 2021, a number of us gathered for a Lenten study, and we used the book by Sister Joan Chittister called The Time Is Now, A Call to Uncommon Courage. Good trouble and uncommon courage seem to be good messages for these days. In it, Joan Chittister writes, we have a choice. The prophets had a choice. So do we. Faith is invalid unless you're living it. That's the basic message of the prophets. And it is as true today as it was a thousand years ago. Prophetic spirituality is an act of spirituality that demands as much hard rock commitment as it does heartfelt concern. Let us join in our litany, prayer, and commitment. Called by God, as disciples of Jesus, we seek to make a difference. Part of this hope-filled community of faith, united in deep spirituality, but some days we grow weary. Called by God as disciples of Jesus, believing that God is at work in us and through us, we seek to live into our call to bold discipleship. But some days we grow weary. Called by God as disciples of Jesus, always seeing the shape, of, shape our world could be, we seek to embody daring justice, but some days we grow weary. So we pray, God, on the weary days, help us to rely on you. Nourish us and sustain us for your work in our world. Where the world is merciless, we will be God's mercy. Where the world is hopeless, where there is injustice, we will be God's justice. Where there is sadness, we will be God's joy. Where the world is doubting, we will be God's faith. Where there is ingratitude, we will be God's generosity. Where there is confusion, we will be God's truth. Where there is weakness, we will be God's strength. Where the world is wounded, we will be God's hearing. Where the world is weeping, we will be God's song. Where the world is despairing, we will be God's beauty. Where the world is crumbling, we will be God's rock. Where there is no tenderness, we will be God's grace. Where there is loneliness, we will be God's smile. Where the world is dying, we will be God's life. As bearers of the image of God, we will be God.
as we gathered in worship, we lit our Christ candle as a reminder that God is present in this place, the one who is creator, Christ, and spirit will never leave us or forsake us. It is for us a physical symbol of the love that surrounds, sustains, and nurtures us in this place. As we extinguish it at the end of our worship today, we remember that this love continues on in us as we go out into the world. Courage comes from the heart, and we are always welcomed by God, the Cree of all being. We bear witness to our faith, knowing that we are called to live lives of courage, love, and reconciliation in the ordinary and extraordinary moments of each day. We bear witness, too, to our failures and our complicity in the fractures of our world. Deep spirituality daring justice, bold discipleship. May we be courageous today. May we learn today. May we love today.